Norma Jean, the human being, the erratic youth of Marilyn Monroe. The teenage assembly line worker brushed her curly, ash-blonde hair aside to flash a smile at the army photographer. As she did, she left a smudge on her face from her dust-coated hands. That was okay. After all, it's not like anyone was likely to look at the picture anyway. On that 1945 summer day, the photographer had been snapping shots of nearly all the women on the assembly line. Hers would simply blend in with the others. The Missouri-born picture-taker David Conover had been assigned to Van Nuys, California's Radio Plane Corporation plant to capture military magazine photos of attractive assembly line girls. The pictures were intended to boost the morale of the male soldiers in combat. Norma Jean Dougherty didn't consider herself as one of the attractive girls at the plant, Although she now filled out her company overalls quite well, she vividly remembered that just a few years previously, boys teased her about her skinny frame. She could still remember them chanting Norma Jean the human being as she passed. Once Conover took her picture, she continued attaching propellers and spraying a plastic coating on the small airplanes. The little radio-controlled planes were used by the military as targets during anti-aircraft practice. After he finished the photo shoot, he retraced his steps and introduced himself. I'm Norma Jean Dougherty, she responded as she summoned a sparkling smile and offered her hand. She was beautiful, Conover later told a magazine reporter. Half child, half woman, her eyes held something that touched and intrigued me. He arranged a photo shoot for her lunch hour. After she had wiped the smudges off her face and donned a sweater from her locker, she began to pose for Conover's camera. Suddenly, the inexperienced teenager lit up with a natural instinct of a seasoned model. Conover was so enthusiastic he could hardly hold the camera still. Norma Jean, however, being on the other side of the lens, had no inkling of the importance of the moment. Am I really photogenic, she inquired? That question would be enthusiastically answered by millions of fans during the years ahead. Like the doomed little airplane she spray-painted, her career would one day soar among the clouds before it was intercepted by an overpowering force followed by a devastating crash. Before that flight was interrupted, however, she would blaze a path across the stratosphere, gracing countless magazine covers and emblazoning her new name, Marilyn Monroe, on theater marquees around the world. Years before that phenomenal flight, though, young Norma Jean's life journey seemed anything but bound for the sky. Her mother, Gladys Mortensen, worked as a film cutter at Los Angeles's Consolidated Film Industries. She gave birth to her on June the 1st, 1926, in the charity ward of the Los Angeles General Hospital. Although Gladys listed her baby's father as Edward Mortensen, her divorced second husband, many biographers feel it was actually C. Stanley Griffith, one of her co-workers at the studio. Griffith, a dapper ladies' man sporting a pencil-thin mustache, made it clear to Gladys that he had no interest in playing a fatherly role. Nonetheless, Gladys bravely entered the hospital to bring her baby into the world. Smitten by Hollywood's glamour, she named her daughter after the then-popular screen idol Norma Talmage. Not only did Gladys face the challenge of single parenting, her emotional strength was shaky to begin with. Both of her parents finished their lives in mental institutions, and her brother Marion 
was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. Many historians feel it was actually bipolar disorder. As if Gladys's odds of success weren't low enough, she married at 16 and spent years in an abusive relationship before filing for divorce. Soon she moved to Hawthorne, a Los Angeles suburb where her mother was living. Unfortunately, Mom was preparing to leave the country to hopefully rekindle a flame with her estranged husband. Gladys made arrangements to stay in Hawthorne with Wayne and Ida Bolander, a couple who took in boarders and fostered several children. Within a couple of weeks, she returned to her work at the film studio, placing Norma Jean in the care of the Bolanders, but making regular visits to see her. By 1933, when Norma Jean was about eight years old, her mother was finally able to put a down payment on a little bungalow near the Hollywood Bowl and take her daughter back. During this period, Gladys would often take her out to the movies. As the little dreamer stood in front of Grauman's Chinese Theater with her feet planted firmly in the footsteps of movie idols like Gloria Swanson and Clara Bow, she hoped to one day leave her own there. Sadly, this period was much too brief. In early 1935, Gladys's fragile emotional state devolved into madness. According to some reports, she shouted threats as she wielded a kitchen knife. Other than a few short periods, Gladys remained institutionalized for the remainder of her life. As police hauled her off to a local hospital, they also took with them her daughter's childhood. The next few years of Norma Jean's life ricocheted between brief stays with relatives, foster families, and a couple of years spent in the Los Angeles Orphans Home Society. Although Marilyn would later summarize this period with a poignant statement of I was never used to being happy. The same dreams that filled her head as she stood in the footprints in front of Grauman's also helped lift her spirits. She would gaze out of the orphanage window toward the RKO Studios water tower, renewing her dreams of stardom. Marilyn would later say that even though she knew thousands of other girls were dreaming the same dreams, she was convinced she was dreaming the hardest. The opening scene of her life was not far away as she peered out that window. It commenced with that click of the army photographer's shutter and played out through the years ahead in a dazzling collage of scenes as diverse as young Norma Jean's early life. She married a local boy, Jim Dougherty, when she was only 16, primarily to avoid going back to the orphanage. While serving in the Merchant Marines, Dougherty was sent to the Pacific. During this time, Norma Jean encountered Conover, the Army photographer, who soon helped her find modeling jobs. As her modeling career took off, the Hollywood movie moguls began to notice her as well. Ben Lyon, a 20th century Fox executive, decided she needed a catchier name. Putting their heads together, Norma Jean offered her mother's maiden name of Monroe, while Lyon selected a name from one of his favorite Broadway stars, Marilyn Miller. When Dougherty returned, he was adamant that she quit her modeling and acting career and conformed to the then traditional role of making his meals and ironing his shirts. As history is aware, she didn't. Instead, she quit the marriage. This, of course, would not be the last marriage she would quit. Her highly publicized unions with both Joe DiMaggio and Arthur Miller similarly ended in divorce. Her career, like her relationships, often fell short of her childhood dreams and expectations. Despite a lifelong desire to become known as a serious actress, 
Marilyn Monroe is better remembered as the first Playboy centerfold and the shapely actress standing over Manhattan's Lexington Avenue subway grating as a blast of air lifted her dress. Only 17 years spanned the clicking of David Conover's camera to the tragic closing scene shrouded in barbiturates and controversy. During that fleeting career, the turmoil between dreams and reality mirrored the early life of the little girl who was shuttled between foster homes and an orphanage. Just behind the iconic platinum blonde with the entrancing eyes and the flaming ruby lipstick forever lurked Norma Jean, the human being.